Hi guys and welcome to class two. Um, we're going to talk today about the three processes of memory and now the processes of memory is what we do with information to actually turn it into memory um, that you can use. Um, and there's a computer analogy here that really um, is useful to think about. So um, think about if you, know, if you have something written on a piece of paper um, and you want it to be in your computer, what has to happen? And the first thing that has to happen Happen is you need to type it right um, or maybe you scan it or maybe you have voice recognition software um, but that's the first thing you need to do but that's not adequate right that puts it temporarily in your computer and then you need to hit save um, if you're going to um, make any sense of that right if you're going to um, have it for later um, and then later when you want to use it you have to be able to retrieve it on your computer you need to open a file um, and so we're going to talk about um, encoding, which is the equivalent of typing it on your computer. We're going to talk about storage, which is the equivalent of hitting save. Um, and we're going to talk about um, uh, retrieval, which is the same as opening a file. And it shouldn't be surprising that um, we have a memory process that is analogous to a computer memory process because we created computers and so we gave them memory that works the way we're used to memory working. Um, and so before we go any further, um, I, I would love for you in a moment just to pause the video and, um, and to try this exercise. I want you to close your eyes and to uh, imagine a place that, um, that you know really, really well. And so if you close your eyes and start uh, visualizing that place, um, and then what I'd love for you to do is to think about um, and call up sounds that you connect with that place. So maybe it's the sound of water or the sound of music. Um, and then if you can, um, I'd love for you to call up um, a scent perhaps that you associate with that place. And so maybe food that um, you, you know, cooking that you've eaten there or the smell of the beach or the smell of the woods or whatever the scent is. Um, and then also a taste if you can. Um, and then finally, um, a uh, tactile sensation if you can. So if you're imagining yourself um, at the beach, perhaps the sand, if you're imagining yourself um, in uh, a particular room in a home, maybe the feel of the furniture. Okay, so pause the video and try to call up information on all five of your senses in that way. And then rejoin me. Um, so the, um, what do you want to call it? <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, the first process we're going to talk about is encoding, and this is the equivalent of um, typing information to get it into your computer initially. Um, and the analogy is that this is your um, first attempt to get information in your brain. And to understand encoding, what you really need to think about is back when we talked about the biology chapter, um, we talked about the fact that the only information your brain can understand is electrochemical information, um, that essentially your brain, only, the only language your brain has is neurons um, turning on and firing. Um, and some of you may know that the only language computers have is binary code, um, binary meaning two, right? Um, and for computers, um, all computers operate on a language that is just a series of zeros and ones. And so when I think I'm uh, typing in the letter K into the computer, the computer on, right on the, on the um, keyboard uh, um, end of things, I'm thinking K and it's got a keyboard that says K, but that keyboard is a translator that then is translating that keystroke into a particular series of zeros and ones. And the same is true for your brain, that encoding is the process of turning information in the world, sound, sight, light, right, of the things into patterns of neurons firing. Um, and you think of your, um, you think of your sensory organs, your eyes, your ears, as things that let you hear and see, but really very literally what your sensory organs are, your eyes, um, for example, are, trans are just translation organs, that your eyes take light into them, right? Light enters your pupil, it hits the retina. On this side of the retina, there are uh, light sensitive um, cells and they take in the light, but on the other side of the retina are uh, traditional neurons that are going to use chemicals to send messages to the next set of neurons. So your eyes are literally translators. Your ears have something called cilia, um, which are little hairs 
that bend in specific directions depending on what sound waves are coming into your ears. And so they're taking in sound waves by bending, uh, but on the other side of them, they're sending out electrochemical signals. And so they're literally um, uh, translating in that way. And so, um, and so we, that we also have binary code, the binary in our brain, right? It's zeros and ones in a computer, but in our brain, the binary code is neurons on or neurons off and any particular piece of information is just a particular series or uh, or sequence of neurons that are on or neurons that are off um and so we have that encoding going on um and really um you know that this is that first pass at just taking in information but just like if you type on a computer um, and don't hit save, it's only a temporary storage. The same is true in your brain, that you can encode information, but that unless you store information, unless you hit save, that, that encoded information disappears. Um, and so it's a temporary holding place, um, right? And so, but we need to encode before we can do anything else. Um, so the next process that we can talk about is storage. Um, and storage is the equivalent of hitting save on your computer. So we encode lots of information, but only some of it gets saved, some of it gets stored. <clears throat> um, and as we talked about in the last class, um, sometimes storage happens without us trying, implicit memory. So you may know song lyrics, for example, that you never tried to know. Um, and you're not even aware you know them until you find yourself singing along to the song. Uh, whereas other times, like as in academic information, we have to work really hard to store information. Um, and that's more explicit then. All right, so let's think about what makes for good storage. And, and I think this conversation is particularly useful for students because you are all professional storers of information. And the basic rules of thumb about what do we store well um, depends on the quality of attention and the quantity of attention that we give any particular thing. Um, students often just focus on quantity. How long do I stare at the information for without paying attention to the quality of the, of the attention that you're giving? Um, the other kind of things to think about in terms of what do we store well um, is that if you think about um, what we're trying to do, that what we're trying to create is neural patterns or patterns of neurons firing that we can replicate that we can make them fire again. That's the experience of memory. So in that example where you were recalling being someplace else and you're sitting where you are now, but you're, your mind was someplace else, you essentially were replaying patterns of neurons firing. Um, and if you create well-worn pathways, if you make that pattern fire over and over and over and over, then it's easy at any given moment to make it fire again. Um, and so creating those well-worn pathways are about um, over and over, repetition, but also the quality of what you're asking those neurons to do. Um, and then the other thing, the last thing that we need to um, always be thinking about is that you're not going to store anything, or not, at least you're not going to store it well, unless you convince your brain that the information is important. Your brain is always sorting through information, trying to decide what's important, what am I likely to need again, um, and that there are some things our brain always assumes are important. Um, things that are emotional, as we'll talk a little bit more about, your brain assumes um, that, that emotional things are important. If, I, if, if you have been made to feel something, fear, happiness, sadness, whatever it is, your brain thinks, oh, this is significant to us, right? It, it, we felt something about it. We should hang on to this. Things that are social in nature, so things that have to do with other people, we remember really well. Think about um, even the trivia you know about celebrities. Um, you know, and, and what you can remember about perhaps the Kardashians or somebody else, um, even that is social. But you remember, like often people, my patients will ask me, how do you remember, so, you know, details that we've talked about in the past? And the real answer is that it's happening in the context of a person in front of me who often is talking about highly emotional things. Um, and I don't have to try to remember those. Our brains think those things are important. Um, we also remember self-referential um, information really well. So if it's about us, we remember it well. And so anything we can make self-referential um, will be remembered better. Um, and we remember brand new things. So things that are brand new get our attention. We're really interested in brand new things or surprising things. Um, and we pay close attention to those. Um, so, so just before we kind of end this segment, um, I want you to think about things you remember easily without trying. 
So think about how sports practice worked, for example. Think about how easy it is to remember songs, how easy it is for me to remember things about my patients or for you to remember things about your good friends. Um, and how, you know, think about how those easily remembered things um, kind of fit what we're talking about here. Um, and then we'll talk about some specific examples and expand on this a little bit in the next video.